this. I have prepared the specifications for the Su-57 engine, sir. Okay, sure. Let's see what you got. Please cast it on the screen. Executing. Hmm. Yeah, good, good. Very good. Nice job. Really nice job. Where did you get the sources? I hacked into a NPO Saturn computer. One of their industrial floor cleaners has a control chip that was assembled on the same line as mine. This thing is delicious. Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. This is the second part of the series dedicated to the Sukhoi 57. If you haven't watched the first part, there will be the link up here. So in the previous video we have discussed the aerodynamics, the structures and the general configuration that we've seen, which is very particular. But in this video we will be talking about propulsion, which is an area where the Sukhoi 57 has a bit of a problem. The plane is expected to be delivered with the final Isdelia 30 engine only after 2025. Yeah, but let's start from the beginning. In 2002, shortly after the beginning of the PAC FA program, the program that gave birth to the Suhoi 57, it was immediately clear that a new generation of engines was required. At the time there was a competition between MPO Saturn, the heir of the Liulka Design Bureau, and MPP Salyut, which is the descendant of the Tumansky Design Bureau. MPO Saturn won, but almost immediately the design process of the engine was split in two. An entirely new generation engine was never going to be ready in time for the first flights. Designing a new generation of engine is as complex as designing as the whole plane. So to be ready for a timely first flight, the decision of having a stage 1 and a stage 2 Suhoi 57 was taken. The stage 1 had to be equipped with an improved version of the already proven AL-31, the Stage 2 had to be equipped with the final engine, the Isdelia 30. So the current engine of the Shoi 57 is the AL41F1. It has been derived from the engine of the Sukhoi 35, which is called the AL41F1S, which is in turn a derivation of the AL-31. Compared with the original AL-31, it is bigger, it features a digital control unit, and it provides a lot more thrust. So the engine provides 93 kilonewton of dry thrust and 147 kilonewton with the afterburner. However, Take these numbers with a pinch of salt because in Russian aerospace almost everything is secret. So some of the key numbers that we have are actually estimates. Otis, please, the specifications. The L41F1 is a dual spool, low bypass, after burning turbofan. The low pressure compressor has four stages, the high pressure compressor has nine stages. Each spool has a single stage turbine. The dry weight is about 1,600 kilograms. With a dry thrust of 93 kN, the thrust to weight ratio is 5.49. Thanks, Otis. Well, it is an advanced engine, a powerful one, one of the most advanced in the world, but is not devoid of problems. Its ancestor, the AL31, requires a full overall at the factory after about 1,000 hours of flight. Western engines last much longer. I mean, four or five times longer. We may expect the AL-41 to be a bit better, but definitely not radically better. Furthermore, we have reason to believe that the uprating actually reduced the reliability of the engine, which in turn influences the readiness of the aircraft. This was one of the issues that at least allegedly, 
induced the Indians to abandon the joint program that they were having with Russia. However, the AL-41 is not destined to be completely dismissed and abandoned, because the export Suhoi-57, if any, they will be equipped with the AL-41. Despite the problems and the lack of trust, actually the AL-41 is not heavily penalizing for the Suhoi-57. Coupled with the aircraft outstanding aerodynamics, it is still enough to make the Suhoi-57 the most maneuverable aircraft ever built. The intakes are classic wedge intakes with mobile ramps to control the position of the supersonic shock waves and they are obviously very efficient at transonic and supersonic speed. The conduit section is in irregular loads edge uh, to improve the stealthiness and the radar reflection characteristics. Like on most Russian planes, retractable grids are used at takeoff to avoid the ingestion on foreign object debris. A different grid is used to increase stealthiness uh, by protecting and screening the compressor blades uh, just before the engine entrance. And a similar screening element is added downstream the turbine. And before someone starts screaming that the Russian don't really know what they're doing, they don't have any clue about stealthiness, this is the same solution which is used on the F-18, that was used on the F-117, and even the F-35 and the F-22 have an element to screen the turbine. And last but not least, the engine features thrust vectoring. We will get back to thrust vectoring in the last section of the video, but for now, let's say that it is commonly believed that the nozzles move in a up and down, basically in a sort of a V pattern. For the Suhoi 57, we have the reason to believe that they move 360 degrees differentially and they are controlled by the flight computer. And this is probably the secret of the plane bizarre maneuverability. <laughs> Product 30 is going to be the final engine for the Suhoi 57. It has flown for the first time in uh, 2017 and it is currently undergoing testing. The first Su 57 equipped with the Product 30 is expected to enter production in 2025. Now, NPO Saturn really made a leap forward with this engine. It will be a modern variable bypass ratio turbofan. It will feature a full authority digital control unit uh, connected with the flight computer. It will have a modern plasma igniter. And last but not least, it will feature a new lighter thrust vectoring nozzle with serrated panels. The dry thrust is expected to be 108 kN and the afterburner thrust 176 kilonewton. Russian engines tend to be on the heavy side because, uh, well, Russian engineering, I suppose, but also because the thrust vectoring engine is actually quite heavy normally. The product 30 has changed all this and the thrust to weight ratio with afterburner is expected to be around 11, which is pretty much in the same ballpark as the F-35 engine. And for those who always love to point out that Russia is so way behind the United States in terms of technology, well, this time you're right, Russia is probably 10 to 15 years behind. However, the entry temperature in turbine, which is a very important parameter to qualify the efficiency uh, and the performance of the engine is expected to be a bit above the psychological barrier of the 2000 Kelvin. This will make the Product 30 the hottest engine in the world, even hotter than the F-35 engine. Yevgeny Marchukov, the Lyulka chief designer, is convinced that the combination of variable bypass and the plasma igniter will make the Product 30 less thirsty than the AL-41. He 
it may be interesting to notice that if these numbers are true, even at maximum takeoff weight, the thrust to weight ratio for the Suhoi 57 will be significantly above one. And if the thrust to weight ratio will be high, this means short takeoff and very good acceleration. Actually, short takeoff is a very important feature for the Russians. They do expect that air bases are going to be attacked in case of war, so it becomes important that the aircraft can use the shorter strips that still remain intact to take off. Moreover, such a high thrust to weight ratio would be very useful for a carrier variant should one be developed. The Suhoi 57 is obviously super cruise capable. With the AL-41, the reported super cruise speed is Mach 1.1 or Mach 1.2. But with the product 30, it is expected to reach Mach 1.4 slash 1.5. As usual, take this with a pinch of salt. However, we have seen in another video how Super Cruise is a very important feature because it greatly improves the range and the energy of the air-to-air -air weapons, particularly at very long range. And finally, the elephant on the tail, truss vectoring. Well, obviously this is a controversial and misunderstood feature and it would deserve a video in itself, which we actually did some time ago and uh, the link will be up here. The consensus is that truss vectoring is of limited use and in general similar performances can be reached with the correct design of the aerodynamic surfaces. The Americans investigated this concept quite extensively and this was their conclusion. So the F-22 has a simplified thrust vectoring, the F-35 has none, and no European project actually features it. And when the United States Air Force could test the flanker on their own terms at the end of the Cold War, they had their view confirmed. Furthermore, Members of the Indian Air Force who fly the Suhoi 30 MKI, with actually features truss vectoring, they declare that it is used as a sort of last resort to increase the pitch of the plane and increase the instantaneous turn rate. This will be used to point the noose at the opponent, but if the maneuver fail to shut down the enemy, then the aircraft is left very, very vulnerable. There is an interesting video on YouTube of an F-18 Super Hornet uh, fighting against a Su-30 MKM of the Malaysian Air Force and defeating it repeatedly despite the use of thrust vectoring. So, case closed. Well, we are left with two possibilities. One, the Russians are a bunch of idiots who spend money and add complexity and weight to their top-of-the-line fighters just to add a useless feature. Two, the Russians know something that we don't know, or at least they plan to do something that we don't know, where trust vectoring has a role. Now, I wish I had an answer, but I don't. What I have are a couple of considerations and a couple of hypotheses. The first consideration is that there is still a vast underestimation of Russian technology in the West. This is a legacy of the Cold War. In fact, the gap has never been as wide as it was perceived, and in the last 30 years, the same gap has narrowed quite a lot. Today, there are reports of the American intelligence where they clearly state that the Russians are ahead in a number of key technologies. This could be the subject of an entire long video, but what matters the most is understanding that Russia has radically changed the doctrine that they are using from the Soviet one. They have learned lessons from the wars in the Middle East too, but what they are doing is not trying to imitate the West, they are always trying to build some level of asymmetry 
in their doctrine and in their tactics. The second consideration is that no Russian system designed for export has the same feature of the systems in service domestically. This is a common practice in Russian industry and some level of downgrading is always applied. So there is a small but real possibility that should a confrontation with the Russia erupt, the systems that the West is going to face are not exactly the same systems that has been faced in these years around the world. Okay, within this context, we can make two hypotheses. The first hypothesis is that trust vectoring is implemented for flight efficiency reasons. It is in principle possible to trim the plane not using the aerodynamic surfaces, not deflecting the aerodynamic surfaces, but orienting the engine thrust. Why would you do that? Because in this way, you could keep your aerodynamic surfaces at the lowest drag possible, compatible with the flight. An effect like this is probably small, but surely not negligible, and there is the possibility that something like this has been implemented. Mind, this is speculation, we have no specific news about it. Another hypothesis revolves around the idea that thrust vectoring allows unconventional maneuvers. For example, using thrust vectoring with a very quick deflection is possible to give the plane a jerk, so to speak, sideways, that changes the flight path, changes the speed and acceleration vectors of the plane. It would be a sort of instantaneous maneuver. Why this would be important? Well, modern air-to-air -air missiles use guidance criteria, which in general tend to predict or anticipate the point of impact. The missile is not chasing the plane. The missile is trying to anticipate the impact because, well, it's much more efficient. Now, the digital filters used on the missiles have to make a prediction. And the prediction is normally based on speed and acceleration of the target. If the acceleration of the target is somehow unusual, there is the possibility that the algorithm gets confused. In which measure this is going to affect the weapon, it's very difficult to say. It's probably not going to throw the weapon totally off course, but could make the interception trajectory less efficient. Again, this is just a maybe, this is just my speculation, but that would be really interesting to know. Bottom line is, I think we had better not dismissing this feature as irrelevant or useless. That's all for now. Thank you very much for watching and see you the next time.